Project Almost Here, based on the true top-secret United States Air Force investigations of the same name, Project Blue Book follows Aidan Gillen as Dr. J. Allen Hynek, a brilliant astrophysicist and college professor that was recruited to spearhead this clandestine operation. Each episode will draw from actual files, blending UFO theories with authentic historical events from one of the most mysterious eras in United States history. The new drama series Project Blue Book premieres Tuesday, January 8th at 10, 9 central on History. Visit history.com slash Project Blue Book to learn more. Hello, Star Talk family. The episode you're about to watch was recorded shortly before the tragic passing of celebrated writer and TV host Anthony Bourdain. We're thankful for the opportunity to share Anthony's unique perspective in the universe on food, culture, and life. On behalf of all of us, Hawk, thanks for watching. Welcome to the Hall of the Universe. I'm your host, Neil deGrasse Tyson, your personal astrophysicist, and tonight we're discussing the science of food. And we're featuring my interview with chef, writer, and TV host, Anthony Bourdain. So let's do this. So, Meet my comedic co-host for this evening, Sashir Zameda. Sashir! Excellent. You're tweeting at The Sheer Truth. Yes, I tweet Brilliant the truth. Twitter handle. Yeah. Love it. And I've got with us a real live food scientist, Guy Crosby. Guy, welcome to Star Talk. Thank you, Neil. Thank you. You're also known as the cooking science guy. <laughs> uh, you're adjunct professor of nutrition at the Harvard University School of Public Health. Correct. Uh, it's up in Boston, sure. And former science editor for America's Test Kitchen. That's right. Very good, because we're featuring my interview with chef and renowned foodie Anthony Bourdain. And you know, he's host of CNN's Parts Unknown. And what they do is they send him to all corners of the earth, mm -hmm. and he explores food in the context of their culture. Brilliant concept which he executes beautifully. He does. And so I wanted to know, did he have any early experiences with math or science that might sort of help to guide him or tune him on this path? So let's check it out. Algebra, strangely enough, was the best I ever did at any math subject. I could somehow picture that. But um, uh, science, you know, I like dissecting frogs. I mean, who doesn't? Right. Well, <laughs> <laughs> it served me well later as a lesson. chef. <laughs> <laughs> you know where all the leg muscles are. In I do. <laughs> <laughs> Little did your biology teacher know that this was for for later eating. Yes. <laughs> so uh, tell me how you came to think about food and culture. Because the fact that the very phrase, it's a matter of taste, mm -hmm. means I might like something that you don't and vice versa. So... What does it even mean for you to have a show to talk about what's good and what isn't? Well, it is completely subjective. I mean, they say that, that uh, all, all food tastes are acquired or are, are, are learned, that they are not, I mean, babies will eat rotten food if their, if their mothers say this is good. Uh, I think bitter we, babies, at least in this country, react to negatively. Hence, no vegetables. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I never evaluate food on the show anymore. I don't use adjectives anymore. I never say, well, I have, I have no toast, you know, background notes of minerality. Does this help anyone in any way? I, I, I say, wow, this is really good. Or I'm not so sure about that. Um, but it's entirely subjective. Um, I know that some people have a genetic inability to taste certain flavors or experience them, them differently. I have a chef friend who who uh, did a lot of experiments with that. One out of a small group of people will not detect certain flavors at all. Well, if they become a colony, they could end up creating dishes that would be offensive to those who taste that, who yeah. have the capacity to taste it, and they don't, mm -hmm. and therefore it's just fine to them. Yeah, for example, I think one of the things that's prevented uh, the Philippines from taking their uh, rightful place as a major world cuisine beloved by everybody on every corner, I think that's because, my guess, uh, 
they like an element of bitterness. And in fact, in the Philippines, they will use bile um, to add that, you know, very important note to uh, some of their uh, traditional dishes. And that's a, that's a taste that Americans, you know, I think, instinctively recoil from in a way that they just simply do not. That, that's, a, that's a treasured component. We have textural uh, predilections and aversions that seem innate or at least are so deep in our culture. America, we love anything crispy. You know, anything covered in batter and crispy, we're, we're going to love. It's better. We don't even need anything inside the batter. We'll eat the batter. <laughs> <laughs> but when you get into that chewy, uh, rubbery, uh, gelatinous, you know, uh, boiled chicken skin, fish skin, um, abalone, uh, a lot of things that they really love in you know, tendon in China and Japan. Tendon. Beef tendon's great. It's fantastic. But look, look at you. I mean, that's, that's most Americans go, oh, dude, no. So, Guy, explain to me. Explain to me. How is it that somebody could find something to be a delicacy and I would just find it to be nasty? What is the science behind that, other than just possibly missing the same taste, you know, not having corresponding taste buds? Because that can't be, that can't explain everything. No. Right, so, so what's going on there? Well, so we can break this question down into two parts, right? There are foods that people like and dislike, and then there are foods that just plain disgust people. So the, the foods that we learn to like and dislike, that really has to do with sort of genetic inheritance, it has to do with um, the maternal diet, it has to do with, you know, how what children ate as they grew up and their culture that they grew up in. You know, like comfort foods, people have a comfort foods they like. Is there anybody in the world who doesn't like ice cream? Um, I don't really like maybe ice cream. One you don't two. like ice cream? I don't like cold things. What the hell? What? <laughs> Do I have to go? Security. <laughs> Do I have to right, leave? We'll get back to you in a minute. Go. <laughs> so, what I was going to say, but now there are foods that people dislike, like oysters, right? Oysters are because they're slimy, or some people just don't like to eat anything that's live and kicking. So, it reminds me of a little poem that uh, Roy Blunt once wrote. He says, I prefer my oysters fried. That way I know my oysters died. Oh, okay. <laughs> that's a fast poem so, right there. Yeah. Okay. Uh, but then you get into the foods that disgust people, right? And that generally is out of fear. People, a fear of being harmed, and that's what makes them so. They've done so it's animal- psychological, not scientific, yeah. not, not um, physiological. Yep. Well, they've done animal studies where they fed animals things that make them sick, and the animals will never eat that food again, whatever. Ever. So, you know, I think the, the example there is like durian fruit. If you're familiar with that, dur- for South people in Southeast Asia, they love that stuff. It's the king of fruit. But in the Western world, the aroma just is revolting to people. It smells a combination of, I'll say it nicely, uh, pig excrement mixed with turpentine and spoiling onions. So, dang. <laughs> not a please. Well, she'll, she'll eat it as long as it's not cold. Okay. She'll, 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 she'll eat it. What? Heat it up, it's fine. <laughs> so, so what part of liking food then is not subjective? So anything we taste, because what we taste, the receptors for our taste are built into our genes. Right? So these evolve through history as a means of survival. So we like sweet things because it's a source of energy. We don't like bitter things, as Anthony was saying, because... A lot of toxic materials are very, very bitter. So that's pretty objective, is that it's built into the brain. But flavor, that's created in your mind. Mm. So that's very, very subjective. Wait, wait, so Shasir, do you think there are any foods that are just objectively gross? Candy corn. <laughs> I don't think anyone likes candy corn. When they put it in your in your trick or treat, like, that, you get so no, upset. No, I'm, it's like this is the worst one. Yeah, I throw it back. I'd rather have them. bile. <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> so, Guy, you said uh, we have, what are the tastes that we all have? So you get the sense from your mouth that's taste, from your nose, smell. It goes in your brain, and your brain then takes those two, puts them together, and creates the image of flavor. We don't taste anything that's actual flavor. Your flavor is created in your mind. Oh, so it could be in the future when we start tickling the neurons of your brain, Uh we can make you taste anything we want. It's very possible, yep. So uh, does everyone have the same number of taste receptors? This would be a chemical intersection of your uh, olfactory glands and the molecule, I presume. Right. 
No, they don't. There's a big genetic difference. Really? Between, yes, what people can taste. There are things people we call super tasters. They are extremely sensitive to bitter. So I bet the countries that have nasty food, they have very few taste, taste buds. Well, I don't know about that, but you can easily tell by just sticking your tongue out. You can say here on this show, this is a late night show. And, you can and just looking say in the mirror. All those bumps on your tongues, those are your taste buds. And people that are super tasters have lots more of them. I don't know. You may be a, non, a taster or a non-taster. <laughs> uh, so, so if you have more of them, so more is better. More is better. Well, more is more. Well, not no, necessarily. More is more. Whether or not it's better. Uh, super tasters, though, are very, very picky eaters. Oh. They don't like a lot of things. They don't like a lot of vegetables, for example. So they tend to have higher incidence so of cold. So now problems. they have a physiological excuse. Yep. For not eating To veg- reject the vegetables. Yeah, I'm afraid so. Okay, you shouldn't like, do oh, that. Just my taste buds. Did my I taste could, buds. But... Physiologically, I would be there <laughs> with you, yeah. but no. <laughs> my doctor said I just have too many taste buds. <laughs> so this is fascinating because there's science infusing what yeah. we experience at least three times a day. So I wanted to ask Anthony's uh, thoughts about the role of science in the kitchen. Okay. Is it just for the artist or is there room for the science geek? such as yourself. Let's check it out. You know, when you scramble an egg, uh, I forget what it's called, the coagulation of proteins, I'm not sure about yeah. the specific processes, but we're, we're all, uh, uh, you know, caramelization, you know, why does your steak get brown as you cook it and develop the sugars on the outside? All of these things are essential scientific techniques or processes. There's a science reason for Every cook understands instinctively. They may not be able to name what's happening, but they understand very, very, very well when, you know, the effect you want, how to get there, when it's going wrong, when it's going right. Um, So even something as simple as scrambling an egg is essentially a scientific manipulation of an ingredient uh, by exposing it to both heat and movement and incorporating air, you're making it behave, an egg behave in a in the desired way. Uh, it reminds me, this is an obscure analogy, but it reminds me of uh, when medicine became modern. It did so because, in part, it looked to see what sort of folk remedies existed around the world and cultures. Oh, you chew on this bark, mm-hmm. and that gets rid of your headache. Well, what, what got rid of your headache? So you find out what's in the bark, right? and there's this molecule that becomes what we today call aspirin, mm-hmm. and so you extract the active ingredient, right? and then you can exploit that to great gain. And so it seems to me, if you knew exactly the moment and why a sautéed onion becomes sweet, mm-hmm. you can possibly hone in on that and exploit that fact with other foods. And, and that's what chefs are doing, uh, some chefs are doing every day. I have friends who are rotting all varieties of things in some dark corner of their cellar, experimenting, uh, talking to uh, uh, microbiologists uh, from major universities, talking to them late at night, working with them in kitchens, uh, discussing you know, the wonders of fermentation. What can you ferment? What can you, what's going on in miso? How can I apply that to something else? I love miso. I love miso. So much of of, of food is not about freshness. It's what's called that sweet spot. The, The precise moment in its decay where it is best. Sushi being the best example. Anyone who comes and tells you that you know, oh, I went to a sushi bar last night. It was it was the best. The fish was so fresh. I have no understanding at all of sushi. It's not sushi is not about freshness at all. First of all, even the best places deliberately cure their fish by freezing it. Uh, some out of sometimes out of necessity to kill uh, uh, the critters. Uh, others because it makes it better. Um, but it's almost never about the freshest fish. Fresh fish is right out of the water, is still in rigor, and it's often rubbery and unpleasant and without much flavor, uh, which is why in Iceland they rot it sometimes because you get more funk. You're looking for the perfect point in the decay of the fish. Same with meat. Almost everything we eat, like cheese, meat, fish, uh, they're all aged. Just wine, 
um, so it's really about decay and rot, <laughs> cheerful as that sounds. <laughs> Damn, this, this, I never knew. Thank you. <laughs> so, Guy, scientifically, what's, what's going on when food decays? Just straighten us out about that. And simultaneously tell us why, for some mysterious reason, that tastes better. All right, well, what happens is the animal's natural enzymes actually break down the proteins. And what that's doing is that's creating a lot of things called peptides and amino acids that are loaded with umami flavor. So not only does it make it more tender, but it actually adds a lot of this umami flavor to things like aged beef or anchovies or these things that have gone through that kind of aged processing. Uh, and uh, cheese as well. Cheese as well, yes. Um, so is this just trial and error where you do it until you, you do it a little too much, then you die? And a little, <laughs> a little not enough, it doesn't taste good? Well, so, so how do you guarantee hitting that sweet spot, or is it just trial and error? Uh, hopefully it's more than better than trial and error. That's where I think science does come into it, that maybe, you know, the way you design your experiments where you don't go beyond the sweet spot and end up dying... You know, you need, to, you need to set it up and be able to tell when things are just about right. And that's how you design the experiments to give you that information. Yeah, I'm really That's where bad science at helps. You're bad at what? Figuring out, like, when things are not bad anymore. Yeah, <laughs> or like okay. Or, when things have gone past the sweet spot. So, yeah. so do, you, do you like stinky cheese? I mean... I'm bad at, like, smelling, generally. Are you the first to smell? Oh, let me smell that milk to see yeah, if it's I'll bad. Yeah, I'll smell the milk, and I'll be like, it's probably fine. And then it's not. Oh. Okay, so you have, you're, you're very sensitive to it, then. No, no, I mean, no. If you, you, you smell milk, and you say, it might be bad, but then it's, you drink it, and it's okay. Well, I guess I'm just like, the expiration date's made, made up. It's probably fine. Huh? They're, they're trying to get more of my money. So, I'm going to drink this milk time. I'm done with it. <laughs> I'm not to testing listening. that hypothesis. <laughs> let me presume they're all lying to me and let my milk go past its expiration date and well, then drink I, it I then. I don't let it. I'm a busy woman. I just <laughs> haven't gotten around to drinking a full gallon of milk yet. <laughs> so, what's the difference between fermentation, which we all know and love, uh -huh. uh, is responsible for most of the alcohol we drink, and uh, it's something just rotting? Yeah, okay. Was it the same thing? Well, in some ways, it is similar. The fermentations created by bacteria called lactobacillus bacteria that form lactic acid. It lowers the pH, and that stops all other bacteria, especially the harmful ones that might spoil the food and make you sick from growing. Oh. So we're, we're not So the good sensitive. bacteria wins out over the yeah, bad bacteria. and we're not... You know, lactobacillic bacteria don't make us sick, all right? But the bad ones are... Oh, so you can err on the too much side, yep. and, and you might not like it, but it's not going to kill you. Correct. So I wanted to ask Anthony about food in space. Mm. And you know he's thought about this, because he thinks about food everywhere, including space. So let's check it out. I did a, a, an episode of Top Chef at uh, NASA headquarters, and um, we were talking about food in space. And, of course, your entire uh, taste perception, I was told, I was talking to, uh, I think, Chuck Yeager. The Chuck Yeager, yes. yeah. And uh, talking about uh, what you crave, you know, when you've been away from, you know, your favorite restaurants for, or any restaurants for a considerable amount of time. And he talked about how your your ability to perceive flavors changes at altitude. People experience this in planes, of course. Uh, plain food is is altered so that it, it makes up for the effects of altitude. But astronauts get it really bad, and the stuff they crave more than anything, so uh, Mr. Yeager told me, is uh, hot sauce. Mm. Like, you know, Tabasco or anything spicy, because up there everything tastes bland. So you're telling me those those bulky areas in their spacesuits, they're, they're smuggling bottles of hot sauce on the way up. <laughs> uh, the astronauts I've spoken to, they say this uh, without hesitation, that um, they, they eagerly want spicy foods. Yeah. And they find themselves visiting other national modules of the space station where their food tends to be spicier <laughs> than the American food. <laughs> yeah, so that would be tough for me, bland food for nine months. Yeah. Um, I went, uh, I trained in jiu-jitsu, and uh, I foolishly you know, decided I was going to compete a, a few times. And in the run-up to the competition, uh, I had to cut weight to make my weight category. 
which meant doing without salt at all mm. for so a week. So you don't retain the water, yeah. Uh, it, it's horrible. It's, it is horrible. Uh, I, no matter how much I eat, I mean, I boil a whole chicken loaded with herb and pepper and, and, and everything I could, but never satisfied. And I would just get crazier and crazier from the lack of salt to the point that I found myself sitting on the subway in the summer looking at a particularly sweaty homeless dude and thinking, oh, I'd like to lick his neck. <laughs> just, just one lick. <laughs> <laughs> that is fascinatingly gross. <laughs> so physiologically, the body knows what it needs. Is that yes. what this comes down to? It does, yes, in this case. So, he needs it that badly. Yeah, well, salt has a very, very important role, among other things. But one of the most important things is it maintains the fluid level in the body. So, Which he's trying to disrupt. Well, yeah, if, on you, purpose. if you went the other way and you had too much salt, you have too much fluid, and that's when you get high blood pressure. But if you have almost no salt, you have, you know, and no fluid, you have a real strong craving because you want to reestablish that balance of getting just the right amount of Enough salt to blood. lick the neck of a homeless well, person in the street. I'm not sure he'd go that far, but yeah, it shows you what an extreme. He had the thought. Yes, he did. <laughs> So the body's trying to take care of itself. Yes, it is. In spite of whatever your stupid ass behavior <laughs> might be doing with it. Yes. Yes, okay. <laughs> just, just getting your buy-in on that. Support for today's show comes from Project Blue Book, based on the true top secret 1950s and 60s United States Air Force investigations of the same name. Project Blue Book follows Dr. J. Allen Hynek, a brilliant astrophysicist and college professor that was recruited to spearhead this clandestine operation. In total, there were 12,618 UFO sightings reported during Project Blue Book, of which 701 remain unidentified. And each episode will draw from actual files, including Dr. J. Allen Hynek's personal journal entries. It's a blend of UFO theories with authentic historical events from one of the most mysterious eras in United States history, starring Alan Gillen of Game of Thrones and Michael Malarkey of The Vampire Diaries, executive produced by Academy Award and Golden Globe winner Robert Zemeckis. The new drama series Project Blue Book premieres Tuesday, January 8th at 10, 9 central on History. Visit history.com slash Project Blue Book to learn more. That's history.com slash Project Blue Book. the American Museum of Natural History right here in New York City. We're featuring my interview with celebrity foodie Anthony Bourdain. His food and travel show, Parts Unknown, has taken him on culinary adventures across the globe. And I asked him about the connection between geography and spicy food. Check it out. Why do some regions of the world eat spicy foods and others not? And why does it seem that spicy foods corresponds with latitude on Earth. <laughs> uh, <laughs> the farther away from the equator you get, the less spicy the food becomes. Yeah. Uh, places where food used to rot, uh, people would use spice to cover up the, the funk of, of, of food that was not meat, protein, fish that was not particularly fresh, and also uh, spices preserve food. Um, I think when you look at the spicy food belt, uh, you know, you see people who had to. I mean, this is the story of food. It explains a lot about, you know, if, you, if you're in a, a, a country where there's a lot of dried legumes, often it was a siege culture. People who had to wall themselves up uh, surrounded by enemies and wait for the enemies to die of starvation because they had plenty of lentils. That's an oversimplification, but true. Um, why do people eat really, really rotten food sometimes? Uh, you know, like, do, why, do, why do they like harkarl, a rotten shark in Iceland, which is literally rotted to the point of putrefaction? Their flavor spectrum up there was very narrow. I think they just got, their palates got bored. They needed, you know, how do we, they didn't have access to, to much in the way of spices, so they just started rotting stuff. But I think the, the spice question is simple, no refrigeration and hot temperatures. So, so, Guy, how does spice preserve food? What's going on? 
Well, so all these, the foods start to rot because one reason, the bacteria start to attack them and eat up the proteins and make all these smelly things. But spices are really, really good. Some of them, about a dozen of them, really good antibacterial agents. Things like oregano and thyme, they have really strong activity against bacteria, so they will kill off and preserve the food for a longer period of time. Plus, they will mask any sort of off flavors that might develop in the meantime. So, yes. My favorite spice is scary spice. <laughs> then baby, scary posh, spice. ginger, <laughs> sporty. I forgot all about that. How could you forget? Oh, man, I was like, wait, how old are you? Um, excuse me, <laughs> we're on television right now. <laughs> so, Anthony Bourdain, he, he's tried every spicy food on earth. And then I told him about the spiciest food that I ever experienced. Mm. Let's check it out. I ate at an authentic Szechuan restaurant in San Francisco mm. recently. And I was waiting for the next dish to be some reprieve from the previous dish. Yeah. And that did not happen. 